Hey guys, so this is a continuation of the NCLEX RN 2019 Comprehensive Review. This is Part C in which we will talk about GI, Hepatic, and Pancreatic Disorders. Section 4, GI, Hepatic, and Pancreatic Disorders. So some risks are autoimmune disorders, alcohol, dietary patterns, NSAIDs, age, app surgery, allergies, muscle impairment, obesity, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, and stress. So you want to eat right and exercise, etc. Diagnostic and labs for this. So specific for GI is hydrochloric acid and pepsin. Specific for hepatic, which is the liver, you have the ALT, AST, ALP, ammonia, albumin, and bilirubin. Specific for pancreatic, you have the amylase, lipase, and prothrombin. So I would know which one is specific for both of them because they could ask you ALT and AST. You have to realize that's talking about the liver, not like the kidney, you know? And then we have the fecal occult blood screening, so you want to avoid red meat, aspirin, turnip, horseradish, 72 hours before. Then we go on to colonoscopy, so this is, you're inserting a scope, like a, like a little camera, to see the entire large intestines. So before this, you want to have a bowel prep, so one to three days before, you're going you're gonna to clear all the fecal content, so they're probably going to give you laxatives, etc. You want to clear liquid diet 12 to 24 hours before, and 6 to 8 hours before, you want to be MPO. The patient's going to get sedation, and you want to monitor post-op for excessive bleeding and severe pain. And then we have the liver biopsy to obtain tissue from the liver. You can insert a needle. For that, you want to get consent before. You want to monitor coagulation. The patient should be MPO. Post-op, you want to put the patient on the affected side. I like to ask that. Put the patient on the affected side. And you want to monitor for bleeding because the liver is highly vascular. Then we go on to parasympathesis, so that's also inserting a needle just into the ab wall to take out fluids. That would be for like ascites, etc. So for that, you want the patient to void, sit upright, you can give them sedation, IV fluids, vitals, and before and after you want to measure the ab girth and the lab value. GI tube and feeding. So GI tube consists of NG tubes. GI, so obviously it's going through the stomach. NG stands for nasogastric. It's going in the nose through the stomach. It's used to decompress the stomach. These include leaven, which is a single lumen, and salem stump, which is a double lumen, that includes in suction and a vent. You should elevate the head of bed, verify placement. So the initial verifying placement is always going to be done by x-ray. After that, you could aspirate gastric contents and measure the pH. It should be less than 4. That means it's in the stomach. And you want to do frequent mouth care and keep the patient in PO. And then goes enteral feeding tube. So these are to deliver nutrition to the stomach or small intestine. This include a small born NG feeding tube. What you want to do for this, you also want to verify placement by x-ray. You want to assess the gastric pH before every feeding, and if you're doing a continuous feeding, it's every four hours. You want to place the patient in semi fowlers You want to refeed the risorol to them, nose and mouth care, and replace the tube every four weeks. Just a side note, if the residual is more than 100 milliliters or more than two hours for continuous, you want to hold the feeding and contact the doctor. Then we go on to percutaneous endoscopic gastroscopy. It's known as PIG. So for this, you want to assess the skin and visual. You want to infuse it slowly. You want to flush with 30 milliliters of warm water before and after feedings and place the patient in semi fowlers So complications for enteral feeding tubes could be refeeding syndrome, which is really dangerous, infection, tube misplacement, aspirations, and fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Then we go on to parental nutrition. This is, could be through a PIC line, a central venous line, etc. PPN stands for partial nutrition. That's given through a distal arm vein or PIC line. PPN is used for a patient who could eat but cannot take in enough nutrition that the body needs. Then we go on to TPN. That's for someone who... So TPN for someone who requires a ton of nutrition for an extended time period. This stands for total nutrition. It's given to the central venous catheter. Obviously, if it's given to the central venous catheter, the thing you want to watch out for is infection. Interventions, first of all, you want to verify placement, which is through x-ray. You want to monitor for infection, like I said. You want to change the dressing every 72 hours. You want to change the TPN and tubing every 24 hours. And you want to monitor for electrolytes. The number one thing that they like to ask for TPN is glucose, because it could cause hyperglycemia, because you're giving them dextrose. You also want to prevent an ear embolism. You want to use an infusion pump. And you want to keep 10% dextrose and water available, because if you run out of TPN, you're going to use that in between. Oral and esophageal disorders. So dental carriers, they don't really ask them this. I'm going to go on really quickly. That's tooth erosion from acid. So basically, any causes, any bad oral hygiene, dental plaques, you don't use fluoride, refined carbs, you have less saliva, etc. Anything that bacteria could build up in your mouth. Signs and symptoms are going to be bad breath, tooth pain, erosion, discoloring, etc. We want to tell the patient, 
it's pretty obvious to brush your teeth, floss, increase fruits and vegetables, drink fluorinated water, and have dental screening. GERD is gastroesophageal reflux disease. So that's when the lower esophagus does not close properly, so the stomach contents back up. These, like everyone knows, they have a heartburn, you ate too fast, etc. So risk factors are smoking, obesity, older adults, alcohol, large meals, obstructive sleep apnea. Signs and symptoms are going to be dyspepsia, regurgitation, you're passing gas, dysphagia. What you want to tell the patient is to manage your diet, to lose weight, to elevate the head of bed. You want to sleep on the right side. You want to stop smoking, alcohol, to wear loose clothing, and medication. If you want to see the medication, you should go to my pharmacology video. And also to limit or eliminate foods that could cause a stomach upset like chocolate, caffeine, fried, fatty foods, alcohol, carbonated beverages, spicy, and acidic food. It's pretty self-explanatory. Hiatal hernias is when the part of the stomach protrudes out. Causes are kind of the same as GERD. High fat, caffeine, tobacco, medications, obesity. Signs and symptoms are regurgitation, heartburn, belching, epigastric pain, dysphagia, your feeling of stuffness, chest pain, and all these are worse after meals. What you want to tell the patient is like the same as GERD, to eat small frequent meals, they might have a barium swallow, no eating three hours before bed, you want to sit up right after meals, weight reduction, elevated head of bed, loose clothes, and medication. So basically, what both these are saying is that you should lose weight, eat properly, don't eat foods that irritate your stomach, have small frequent meals, don't eat three hours before bed, avoid alcohol and smoking. Here are some GI disorders that we're about to discuss, like peptic ulcer disease, IBS, IBD, which includes Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, diverticulitis, hernias, peritonitis, and intestinal obstruction. IBS and IBD, irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease. Irritable bowel syndrome is like its name says, something is irritating the bowel. So you're going to have abdominal pain, abnormal bowel motility, like you could have diarrhea or constipation or both, and bloating, like your stomach's hurting you, you know? Treatments are going to be stuff that are good for your bowel and gut, like high fiber diet, exercise, you want to reduce the stress, eat slowly, chew slowly, eat at regular times, fluids, have a food diary to see what's triggering you, and medication, like if you have diarrhea, then antidiarrheal, antispasmodics, etc. Now we have inflammatory bowel disease. So this is an inflammation in the bowel. So this consists of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. The difference between these two is that Crohn's disease can happen anywhere, and ulcerative colitis, like the name colitis means, it happens in the colon, and they both cause ulcers. The causes are family history, Jewish, bacteria, smoking, young adult in their 20s and 30s. Signs and symptoms are ab cramp, pain, diarrhea, stetorrhea, weight loss, fistulas, and specific for ulcerative colitis is bloody stools. Treatment are stuff that are good for your bowel, like rest, record the stools, high calorie, low fiber, low dairy, medications, and surgery. So just remember that ulcerative colitis is only in the colon, Crohn can be anywhere, also, colitis has the sign and symptom of bloody stools, which Crohn's does not. Peptic ulcer disease. There's ulcers in the stomach or duodenum. Some causes are stuff that could cause ulcers, like NSAIDs. This I would note. Remember, NSAIDs causes ulcers. Corticosteroids. H. pylori is a big one. Stress is a big one. Smoking, caffeine, or alcohol. Sign and symptoms. Um, you're going to have pain, obviously, because you have ulcers in your stomach. So you're going to have belching, you're going to have bloating, you're going to have burning, gawking. Made up of gastric or back pain. It's going to be worse with an empty stomach. You're going to have vomiting and millennium. Think of it, an ulcer in your stomach that's going to cause all these harmful stomach stuff. Interventions, you want them to stop smoking, stop alcohol. You want to relieve stress because that could cause it. You want them to fix their diet. Medications, you want them not to have aspirin or NSAIDs because that could cause it. So then we go on to diverticular disease. These are like out pouches, so think of like a pouch herniating along the abdominal wall. So some causes could be aging, constipation, diet, weakness in the colon wall. So think of something weak and not everything moving along, so you have out pouching, like constipation. Signs and symptoms, you're going to have diarrhea with constipation, cramps cardiac fever. Interventions. Diverticulitis is an inflammation and diverticulosis is the regular pouching. So itis is inflammation, osis is just a regular diverticular disease with the pouches. When you actually have the inflammation, you want to have a low fiber diet because if you have a high fiber diet and you keep things going around in the stomach, it's going to kill. So you want to have a low fiber diet and then when you get rid of that inflammation and you have just regular diverticulosis, you want to have a high fiber diet because the reason why is because this disease was caused by constipation and things not moving around. 
You do not want to give them nuts, seeds, kernels, anything that could get stuck in the pouches. Abdominal hernia. A hernia is, it's a weakage that causes an organ to protrude out. So abdominal hernia is the protrusion of the bowel through the abdominal wall. This is because of a weak cause of heavy lifting, straining, pregnancy, something that causes the abdominal muscles to become weak. Aging, male, obesity, ascites, etc. Sign and symptom is, is that the patient's going to feel a lump or mass at the site where the protrusion out. Pain in the groin when lifting, coughing, or rending. And if there's no bowel sounds, that means strangulation, which will cause ischemia. That's an emergency. Interventions, they're going to wear an abdominal binder, fluids, and if necessary, surgery. Next, we go on to peritonitis. This is really important. You should know the signs and symptoms and everything about it. Because anything that's an emergency is important for the NCOC. Peritonitis is an inflammation of the abdominal lining. It could be from infection, etc. Signs and symptoms is that we know. You have a rigid, board-like abdominal. They like to use those words. Rigid, board-like abdominal. And rebound tenderness. Also, nausea and vomiting. Interventions, you want to put them in Fowler, semi fowler position. NG tube to low suction oxygen and antibiotics and tell the healthcare provider right away. Intestinal obstruction, so this is when there's an obstruction in the intestine, some signs and symptoms, the inability to pass stool for more than eight hours, abdominal distension. There's going to be hyperactive bowel sounds above the site of obstruction and then hypoactive bowel sounds below the site. As you know, because if it's been obstructed, you're not going to hear anything below it and, and it's going to be hyperactive above it because it's going to want to get through but it can't. Interventions, you can put them in NPO, you're going to assess the bowel signs, IV fluids, etc. Bariatric surgery. This is for the morbid obesity. For someone with a BMI over 40 or a BMI over 35 with other diseases, or somebody who had a repeat failure of non surgical weight reduction. So, of course, when we have, when we're dealing with obesity, you want to first do non surgical first, like diet, exercise, etc. If that fails, we turn to bariatric surgery. Post-op, you want to monitor the airway, that's the main thing, and then you want to make sure the ab binder is in place, place them in semi-fowlers, ambulate, ab girth before and after, bowel sounds. You want to give them six small meals a day and make sure that it's liquid and parade, especially the first six weeks, and you want to monitor for dumping syndrome. So what dumping syndrome is that it's going too fast. This, every time you see an NCLEX bariatric surgery, you want to watch out for dumping syndrome. To prevent this, you want to give them small, frequent meals. You do not want to drink water with meals, just before and after. You want to eat slowly, and if this happens, you want to lie them flat. Next, we go on to colostomy. Colostomy is when you bring the end of the colon to the abdominal wall to create an opening to evacuate stool. Indications would be for cancer, obstructive bowel disease, colostomy, Crohn's, diverticulitis, if severe, or trauma. Interventions, you want to monitor ostomy drainage. The higher the ostomy is, the more liquidy there is, the lower it is, more closer to the rectum, the more stool-like form it is. You want to empty it when it's a half or a third full. You want to provide emotional support for them. You want to make sure that it's fit to prevent leakage. You want to monitor for complications, and you want to give them patient education. So what you want to tell them is to how to fit and care for it and train it. You also want to tell them to avoid hard to digest food like popcorn, celery, seeds, nuts, etc. You want to tell them to drink a lot. You want to tell them to eat one food at a time. You want to tell them what foods could cause odor and gas like vegetables, broccoli, eggs, garlic, beans, etc. Hepatic disorders. So these are disorders that affect the liver. So first we start with cirrhosis. Cirrhosis is irreversible scarring of the liver. So you're going to have bumps on the liver. Some causes are things that are damaged to the liver like alcohol, hepatitis, and chemicals. Signs and symptoms. So early you're going to have an enlarged liver because there's bumps all over it. Jaundice. GI symptoms and weight loss. Late sign is you're going to have splenomegaly because the spleen is getting larger because it's fighting infection. Ascites, bleeding, clay colored stool because there's no bile in it, tea colored urine because there is bile in the urine, and dyspnea. And the end stage it could even lead to coma. What you want to do, you want to allow the client to rest, daily weights, INOs, do not give them hepatotoxic medications like antibiotics, give them a high calorie diet with low protein and low fat and low sodium and give them medication for pain, do not give them alcohol, and put them on bleeding risk and precaution because the liver is a highly vascular organ. Um, then we go into hepatitis. Hepatitis, as the name says, itis, inflammation, hepa, liver. So it's an inflammation of the liver. Some causes for all different types of hepatitis are organisms, chemicals, and toxins. This disease, hepatitis, you have to report to your local health department. So there's a lot of different hepatitis, but what they like to test on 
A, B, and C. What I would know from this is just how it's transmitted and which one's the most, which one's the worst. So hepatitis A is, is transmitted fecal oral from food and water. Hepatitis B and C are from needles, blood, sex, etc. Symptoms, so you're not going to really have any symptoms except for maybe hepatitis A, you're going to have flu-like symptoms. Um, prevention, so obviously if it comes from fecal oral like hepatitis A, you want to do hand washing. And other ones you want to vaccinate and avoid high-risk behaviors like IV needles, drugs, etc. Treatments are for A, symptom specific, for B, antivirals, for C, antivirals, and minor kidney function. What I would know from this hepatitis is that this is a disease that needs to be reported to the local health department and A is transmitted from fecal oral, so from food, water, and B and C are from needles and blood and sex. And I would know that hepatitis C is the most dangerous one because it could lead to cirrhosis. Gallbladder disease. So cholelocytosis is inflammation of the gallbladder. So if it starts with C-H-O-L-E, those prefix means gallbladder. And then we have cholelocytosis is stones in the gallbladder. So if it ends in itis, it's inflammation. Lithiasis, it's stone. And you know by the prefix, it's in the gallbladder. It would help to know what the gallbladder does. So the gallbladder is involved in releasing bile to break down fat. So if you eat a high fat meal, then the gallbladder releases bile to break it down. So when you overwork the gallbladder, it could cause disease. So some causes that would make you overwork it is obesity, high fat meal, and type 2 diabetes. Sign and symptoms, you're going to have sharp right upper quadrant because that's where the gallbladder is located, pain, or it could radiate to the epigastric shoulder. So you could have pain there. And you're going to have nausea and vomiting after eating a high fat meal because that's where the gallbladder works. And Murphy sign. So that's basically when you ask the patient to, to breathe out, you're going to place your hand on the right side at the midclavicular where the gallbladder is. And if there's pain, that's a positive Murphy sign. Or dark lay color urine. It can be diagnosed through an ultrasound or ERCP. Interventions, you want to give them pain medications because it's extremely painful. You want to have a low fat diet because high fat is when the gallbladder is going to have to work. You're going to check the color of the stool. ESWL, which is basically put in a shock wave to break up the stone. You could take out the gallbladder and you want to prevent dumping syndrome. Pancreatic disorder. Pancreatitis helps in digestion and regulate glucose. Pancreatitis is inflammation of the pancreas from auto digestion. Some causes are stuff that are harmful to the pancreas like alcohol, gallstones, drugs, infections, and trauma. Some of the symptoms, the pancreas is located in the left upper quadrant, so you're going to have mid epigastric left upper quadrant pain. It's going to be worse after meals and when you lie down because the pancreas helps in digestion. You have nausea, vomiting, weight loss, because as we said, it's a digestion thing. Turner sign, which is red or blue discoloration of the flank. Cullen sign, which is blue discoloration around the umbilicus. Okay, and elevated amylase and lipids. Interventions, first they're going to be MPO, and then you want to have jejunal feeding. Then small, frequent, high calorie, that's important, high calorie, but low fat meals. And you want to give them pain medication. You want to monitor the bowel sounds, eye nose. You want them to take enzymes before meals and before snacks. Do not give them alcohol and limit fats. Then we go on to pancreatic cancer. So here you're going to have vague signs, so it's usually diagnosed later, which causes a high mortality rate. Some causes are age, tobacco, pancreatitis, diabetes, cirrhosis, red meat, and obesity. Signs and symptoms, I'm going to read them really quickly. Fatigue, anorexia, passing gas, rotitis, weight loss, abdominal mass, hepatomelagy, jaundice, ascites, clay-colored stool, dark urine, Interventions, great palliative care, pain medication, monitor glucose, nutrition, chemo, radiation, and whoop procedure. So whoop procedure is to remove the pancreatic cancer. It's done if the cancer is on the head of the pancreas. I don't really see them asking any questions about pancreatic cancer, except for just knowing that whoop procedure is done to remove the head of the pancreas. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for part 6E in which we will talk about the musculoskeletal disorders and endocrine disorders. And don't forget to subscribe and like. Thank you.